Growing up in the sleepy hamlet of Moscow, Pennsylvania, Leslie gained a reputation for her blissful, carefree approach to life. She's such a kind soul. She'd do anything for you. Leslie's a, a very kind-hearted person and has, in fact, gotten awards at work for being the most liked person by customers and those kinds of things. So we're very proud of that. After high school, Leslie began dating Tim McGough. In the beginning, yeah, things she was happy and things seemed to be going great for them. But Leslie's best friend, Cricket Boyle, says she wasn't so sure Tim was the one. When I first met Tim, he seemed a little rough, like he, like he really didn't want to be around her friends. And I said, are you sure about this one, Leslie? Because he doesn't seem like he wants all of us together, like he just wants you. And she'd be like, well, we're just new, and you know, when you're just starting to date, that's all you want to do is be together. But after time, others began to notice a distinctly dark turn in Leslie. Because I noticed how she wasn't allowed to come out with us anymore, and she started to be really secluded. He had her all to herself, and she'd tell me like things he'd said to her, and I'd try to tell her, I don't think that's normal for a relationship to be, for you to be spoken to like that and treated like that. There seemed to be a lot of arguing between the two of them. He was a controller and he liked to um, punish her, is the term that I would use. Before Leslie could get out, Mother Nature dropped a bombshell, a baby boy named Colin. The pregnancy was unexpected. Um, neither one of them had the funds to establish a home. And so my wife and I talked about it and decided that we would make our home their home. Leslie claims that Tim began to drink more and work less. Their refrigerator filled from top to bottom with beer. He spent most of his time in the back room in, in the lower level of our house, watching TV and drinking. Leslie told family and friends the heavy drinking turned her lover into a monster. He's choked her at one time, she told me, and pushed her while she was pregnant, pushed her down. I said to Debbie frequently, this guy is going to do something. She had to reach her point where she said, I can't do this anymore. But Leslie still loved him. And instead of ending the relationship, Leslie doubled down, wanting another child. But a newborn only drove home the need to make a dramatic change. Well, at this point, it was the yelling the like towards Colin and then towards her and you could just see like the little boy that Colin was was starting to change and she noticed it too because she was she changed too she was more quiet and walked on eggshells and she was just a different person Leslie found the abuse too much and then found the courage to finally leave her boyfriend you could see she wasn't happy and I I think she was afraid to make the move to get out of that. But when she did find the strength, she did it. Amazingly, within weeks, Leslie reconnected with a childhood sweetheart, Craig Hoover. Like Leslie, Hoover was recently separated and had two young children. Our relationship seemed pretty perfect. We, were, we had a lot of good times, a lot of laughs. But there was someone who thought it wasn't so perfect, Tim McGough. He wasn't happy at all. He thought that I think we were trying to ruin his life of sorts. After what she said was 13 years of emotional and physical abuse, Leslie Bassinelli had finally found happiness thanks to a long distance relationship with her childhood crush, Craig Hoover. One of her first messages to me was, uh, you better not have forgot who I was. And Leslie's abusive ex, Tim McGough, wouldn't forget either. According to Assistant District Attorney Gene Ricardo, McGough was quietly seething over the relationship, a powder keg ready to explode. That's the highest risk for any victim of domestic violence is when they're leaving or when they have left. I don't think she realized how significant the hatred that he had for her. That hatred reached its boiling point on a weekend when McGough was scheduled to have a visit with his sons, but the boys decided they would rather stay home to play with Craig's kids. 
Craig had surprised Leslie with his two girls coming in for the weekend. You know, it's not unusual for kids wanting to be with other kids. And in this particular case, young Colin wanted to spend time with Leslie and Craig and his two daughters. That evening, Leslie and Craig left the kids with her parents and drove to the store to buy them ice cream and rent a movie. Leslie put on a thick scarf to keep the winter cold at bay, but a cold snap would be the least of her concerns. Immediately after they pulled out of the driveway, Craig knew something was wrong. A car had pulled out right behind us, and I had asked Leslie if she had noticed any headlights when we pulled out of her driveway, and she said no, and I'm like, well, you know, this car came out of nowhere, and the car had disappeared, and we pulled out, and then we traveled a couple more miles, there was a car on the side of the road, and we pull up, and I'm like, there's the same car on the side of the road. I said, you know, it's kind of strange, and she kind of brushed it off. Was Craig being paranoid, or did Leslie have a fuming ex on her trail? I didn't really know who it was. I, honestly, at this point. Once they arrived at the supermarket, the car was gone, but now fear was creeping up. On their way home, the mysterious car reappears, and the hair on the back of Craig's neck is standing up. I pulled up to the stop sign, and I looked over, and I'm like, there's that same car. I said, I think we're being followed. And that mystery is now hot on their tail. I had said, you know, it's time to call the police because they've been following us for 10 miles probably at this point. Leslie and Craig are being chased by a madman. Suddenly they realize it's Tim McGough and the cops can't help them. I was the only one on duty in Moscow that night because we usually only work one person a shift because it's a small town. And I told him, I was like, I'll be there as soon as I can. Once Craig's attempts to outrun McGough fail, Leslie calls 911 again. Okay, where are they now? Um, right now we're going to be passing by North Pole Mill Bagel. All right. Almost at 307. Now passing North Pole Mill Bagel. And they're like riding my ass, and anytime we try to, you know, turn around, turn around, they'll go by us, and then once we see us pull up somewhere else, then they'll we'll pull out. I was waiting for a bullet to come through the windshield. That was the thoughts that were going through my head, and it just. It was scary at that point. Just listen in this chilling 911 audio as McGough slams into their car at 60 miles an hour. Oh, are you alone or you with somebody? I'm with somebody. Now they're pulling, they just pulled it out. I'm in <laughs> Oh, Jesus. <laughs> They're attacking the call. Seven. Adam, Leslie, what's going on? It was just violent. They smashed into the back side of us and hit us so hard that it actually put us sideways in the road. And he was pushing on the passenger side of the car. And I just remember, like, looking out the side of my car, like, we're, we're going to die. Okay, ma'am, Leslie, can you pull out? I didn't even know I was knocked out. Yeah, she said I did, but I just looked at her like, are you all right? Still on the phone with 911, Leslie climbs out of the tangled mass of metal. Leslie, are you there? I can't, I can't understand what's going on there. I know. They're going to kill us. They're going to kill us. Where are you? They're going to kill us. This is the blood chilling audio of that horrifying moment. Are you still driving? No, I'm not driving. Yeah, well, sorry. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, sorry. Oh, yeah. I'm screaming. Leslie, where are you? Leslie. Leslie. Oh. Leslie. Come on, Leslie. 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 Ma'am. Um, where are you? I could see him standing in the middle of the road holding her ponytail and a, a knife in his hand. I just stopped in my tracks. I was too far away to do anything else, and I just looked at him and I said, I said, Tim, you got two kids at home? And, and he just looked at me and he said, oh, 
kill both of you. And then he grabbed a hold of her ponytail and then he tried to slice her throat. And then she grabbed a hold of her throat and I thought that uh, she was dying right there. He turned his attention to me and completely forgot about her. And I was fine with that, him follow me. He had his knife in his hand open and he was chasing me around the car. He was, I've joked that he was not gonna high five me if he caught me. Strangers driving by described the carnage in other frantic calls to 911. He killed somebody and they got into a car crash. Come fast. This guy is chasing around this poor woman trying to kill them. And me and my friend are only 17. I really thought that this is where I was going to die, that he was going to catch me at this point. Mercifully, Officer Matt Cianficchi arrives on the scene just in time. When I pulled up, um, Tim McGough was chasing Craig Hoover up the on-ramp to the interstate. McGough surrenders, but what about Leslie? And I had gone over to Leslie to check on her, and she had a, a cut on her face from her, from her lip all the way almost to her ear, and I mean, she was bleeding pretty good. The knife attack was savage, but despite a deep and violent stab, a miraculous moment. Leslie's life was spared. That was the most horrific moment of my life. I thought I was going to die. It's a miracle Leslie Bassinelli is alive. She looked death in the face and survived. <laughs> but with a horrifying tale. He yanked me back again by my ponytail. And he said to me, say goodbye. This is your last <laughs> In her first TV interview, Leslie describes the sheer terror that was the most horrific moment of my life because I thought I was going to die. After her ex-boyfriend, Tim McGough, chased her and her boyfriend while driving and tried to kill them. If I recall correctly, um, he hit us around 60 miles an hour when we were going about 35. <laughs> and when we hit the guide rail, the airbag exploded in Craig's face and he was like knocked out briefly and I thought he died. I just thought I saw my best friend die. So I shook him and I kept saying Hoover, Hoover. At one point I was waiting for bullets to come shooting through the car windows. Like I just, I don't know, it was awful and for people to tell you that there's nobody to help you. That's what they're supposed to be there for. Leslie was used to surviving. She had finally left the father of her children after she says he became controlling and abusive. But she never imagined one dark night would turn so brutal. When I started to run, I saw Tim standing in the middle of the roadway with a knife like this, with just this awful, evil glare and no emotion. He just said, I'm gonna kill both of you. He put the knife in my mouth and sliced it from lip to cheek. And then she grabbed a hold of her throat and I thought that uh, she was dying right there. But they escaped the nightmare, barely. You can tell that he put the knife inside of her mouth and cut her this way. You can see that the, the wound that she had was exactly the way that she described and how he attacked her. And when you look at the blade of the knife, it had a circular blade, so you can see how he would have just cut her. And it was so clear that he, was, that he wanted her dead. I thought that I lost my best friend. Leslie's rushed to the hospital with a deep gash across her face. My mom came over to me and I said, look what he did to me. And I showed her my face. And when she dropped the tissue, or whatever it was, I just, I mean, I said, sorry. And she just cried and she hugged me. And what saved Leslie's life? This is actually the item of property that saved her life. Remember, when Leslie left the house, she put on a winter scarf. 
That scarf saved her. McGough's knife didn't pierce the thick material. So if I didn't have that on, I really wouldn't be here today. Craig would have watched me die in front of him. Oh my God. Um, I mean, but for the scarf, she, she would, this would be a murder case instead of an attempted murder case. Turns out the car McGough turned into a tank had been stolen earlier that day. And looking inside, cops make a disturbing discovery. They found a loaded 22, three two liter bottles of gasoline, soda bottles in a backpack. They said that he had about 70 bullets in his pocket and a Bic lighter. He was prepared to do some damage. Cops show Crime Watch Daily the evidence they say McGough had with him. And chillingly, they believe Leslie and her boyfriend weren't all he was after. They say he may have had mass murder on his mind. Our speculation was, well, he had three bottles of gasoline, and there's three ways in and out, in and out of Leslie's parents' house. So, our, I mean, our speculation was that maybe he was going to torch the house, and as they were running out of the house, shoot them. Something dangerous was going to happen at that home. Tim McGough pleads not guilty even turns down a plea deal of 10 years and takes the stand in his own defense at trial. It was surprising that he, was, he did testify, and it was even more so shocking as to what he testified to. The knife, he said, accidentally opened up. How it was an accident that, he, that Leslie could have sustained those injuries, it just did not make any sense. And the jury saw right through that. We really knew that his, his story was not holding up, and it was a pleasure to really cross-examine him then on those. After less than three hours of deliberation, McGough is found guilty on all 15 counts, including attempted murder. Instead of the 10 years he was offered in the plea deal, he receives a minimum of 21 years behind bars. We got 21 years minimum, which was, which was tremendous, and uh, it, was, it certainly brought justice to the family. At least for 21 years, they'll have some peace. I believe wholeheartedly that if that individual were to be released that everybody's life is in danger in this family. For Leslie and Craig, the physical scars have healed, but the emotional scars are a different story, especially those of Leslie's young son. He blamed himself. And for a six-year-old to tell you, you know, Mom, I'm sorry. If I just would have went to Daddy's that night, none of this would have ever happened. How do you explain to him that it doesn't matter if it was that night or if you went or not. It could have been some other night and it was gonna, going to be some other night. For his part, Craig made a courageous romantic gesture to try and seize control over this tragedy. Only a week after the attack, he drove Leslie back to the scene of the crime. My heart just kind of sank and I started to cry and I'm like, I can't, I can't be here. And I told her that I wanted to make this place happy as it, you know, as it could be, even, even though something horrible had just happened to us the week before. And that's when he took the box and he said, I was gonna wait till your birthday <laughs> in May, but I didn't want you to think that I was going anywhere. And he asked me to marry him. And of course I said yes. And I thought that was a kind of remarkable, it was a nice play by Mr. Hoover. Today, Leslie shares her remarkable story to bring hope and courage to other victims of domestic violence. I want him to know that he, because of a senseless, selfish act, he doesn't get to see his children grow up. He didn't win. This time, I'm on top and he lost. And that in itself is empowering to me. He didn't break me and he's not going to.